My girlfriend works here. It's time. Welcome, everyone. It's good to see you all again. I'm Jake, project manager from Quality Games, and we're here to show you our vertical slice in February development for our third person action platformer, Long Arm of the Law. Now, before we delve too deeply into our February progress, I would first like to reiterate some of the major information in our game that we first told you about last month out of respect to the virtual and the added audience that we have this time. So this is the hero of our robotic western, Motor Rockwell. So in this world, every robot is built with a purpose. Motor is one of the few sheriff bots, and if you look at his design, you'll notice some asymmetry happening with his arms, where one is much larger than the other. Well, when sheriffs are built, they come with two of these long arms, but Motor tragically lost one of his in an accident and had to have it replaced with a smaller prosthetic. And when that loss burdened him greatly, it enabled him to finally wield a revolver in that other hand, and between his two arms is a bot like none before him. And these are members of the crew uh, for the Bandito clan that Motor is hunting down in this game after following a lead that told him that this group may have stolen his arm. Filled with righteous indignation, Motor sets off on a journey to get back what is rightfully his by bringing law to the lawless. So what tools does he have in his arsenal that can help him with that? This brings us back to our core mechanics. So these two objects you see on screen here represent the player's major autonomy in this world. We have the gun and we have this arm. Now your gun appears to be your standard six-shot revolver, uh, but it actually has a special property to it in that the bullets that you shoot are electric and can magnetize metal surfaces. Now your arm, on the other hand, can extend outward out of your body and retract back into itself. So you can grab onto objects from a distance, and once something is grabbed, enemies can either be pulled in or pushed away from the player. But in the case of a pull, uh, how do we know if the object is going to come to us or if we're going to the object? This brings us back to the mass-based interactions we told you about last time. So in this instance, we have a light object. So when we extend and try to pull it back, the object comes to us. Alternatively, when we grab it and push, it goes away from us. In the instance of a heavy object, we can see that when he grabs the object and contracts his arm, he gets pulled into the object. Alternatively, he can push away from the object. And in the case of something that is the same weight as our hero motor, when he pulls, they both come and meet in the middle. And alternatively, when you extend your arm, you're both going to get sent back the same distance at the same speed. So now that we've seen our weight-based interactions, let's go ahead and talk about some of our artistic inspirations and our ambitions. Our ultimate goal with the visual experience is to honor the old Western locations, colors, styles, and tropes, and present them with inspirations we've taken from Fortnite's shape language, color values, and stylization. You can see with the screenshot on the right um, that the objects within the scene have a playfulness with them that we aim to emulate with, for our aesthetic. So even though these are typically like hard objects, they have this like softness to them that we're trying to imbue with our art style. And when it came to researching asset packs that lended itself to the style we want, we weren't really able to find any that suited our look, so we had to create that art ourselves. So in our last milestone, our goal we stated for Vertical Slice was to have these colored sections here in a playable state, with the green section representing the area with finalized art in the scene. We also intended to have a single enemy in the prototype mechanics transferred into UE4, and a new character controller with animations attached to it. And we're pleased to announce that the first two rooms of the game have achieved the state of finalized art, not just one, and we were able to transfer all the mechanics we showed you in Unity last time into our new engine, and then some. We'll be showing you all that soon, so let's go ahead and break down our monthly progress. So we're going to start by looking at our protagonist, Motor Rockwell. What you see on the left side was the proxy model we had for our character as of last month's presentation. One of our challenges and requirements going forward was to refine his shape and model into looking like this concept art you see on the right side that we showed you last time. Here you can see the progress we're able to achieve in the month. On the right hand side is our new character controller. And Rick, I know what you're thinking. I can see the intensity in your eyes. I can feel that question brimming from inside of you. Where is his backside? <laughs> right there. Hang on. There you go. There's that backside. Wait for it. There it is. <laughs> now don't worry. This is just a mix of all animation. It didn't take any time. Uh, but if you want to see actual animations we have for the game, we're going to go through these next few slides. So this is our idol. This is a walk, we have a run, and the next one is going to be a jump. OK, so now we're going to go ahead and take a look at how some of the other characters in our world are coming along. So we saw this enemy right here uh, at the start of this presentation. And here's the progress we've been able to make since last month, where we only were able to show the 2D concept, and now we have it as a 3D model. As the TN Toad namesake implies, though, this is an enemy that can explode. 
So this explosion here releases robotic nuts and bolts, as well as a smoke trail that lingers behind those pieces. We've also applied this effect onto the frog enemy, which explodes in a few different ways that we're going to be showing you in our demo. But now we're going to move on to our asset room. This is a level within the game that our artists place new models in the scene to show how their mass and how their style relates congruently with the other created objects. Specifically within that level, we have this diorama area that enables, enables us to create little scenes out of our pieces and see if they are matching with our intended style. So one interesting pipeline tool we're implementing is this height-based vertex painting. What this tool allows us to do is get a lot more out of our tiling landscape textures. We can add diversity and interest to our textures wherever we need it in the world space on the fly. An interesting implication of this is that we can use this tool to not only decorate our scene, but to paint pathways that can lead the player into our intended areas. So here you can see the overhead revision of the mines that we've done since that image we showed you last month. Not much has changed in terms of the level's flow. We still have the same areas that we intend to show for our vertical demo, but we're restructuring the opening of the level to be a little bit more tight and linear, and you're going to see it in action in the demo coming up shortly. But for now, we've got to talk about the coolest and the sexiest part of game development. Oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> so how do we acquire our data? Uh, so first, we record those tasks in Handsoft, and we take the times from Handsoft. And with those time ranges, we create an average as well as one st standard deviation that goes above and below the average. From there, we create our pipeline so we can figure out how many number of hours we need to spend on an element of the game. And then from there, we create our budget that estimates the max number of elements we can create. And from there, we create our schedule over the span of those 20 weeks that we have. So let's take rooms in our game as an example, like a room inside of a level. The first thing we do is we record the task, so white boxing, set dressing, lighting, etc. We take time ranges with an average amount with a low end and the high end. We create a pipeline in terms of allocated hours per week and a budget uh, in terms of tasks completed over the span of 20 weeks. And from there, we're able to create our schedule with how we build our levels. And to get about one hour of gameplay, we're going to need to make 20 rooms. So here we have uh, used the information to create a pipeline system to best represent that one element, in that case being rooms. On the right side, you can see us calculating how long each element will take for each room, which gives us a total time of 42 hours, um, which is necessary for a large scale planning and the longest time, which tells us how many rooms that we can build. On the left chart, we can use this information to create swimming lanes so that each person can know what is dependent on whom and also to show that multiple rooms can be worked on at the same time. For instance, Level designers, after whiteboxing, go back to a previous room and apply lighting while they wait for models for set dressing. The same applies to the modelers when they are done with the room. They can move on to the next, even if it's not completed by the texture or the lighter. So what this ultimately tells us is that, sorry, by the end of the game, we'll have been able to make 20 rooms, uh, 95 object models, 7 characters, 60 animations, 28 effects, 26 UI elements. So now we've addressed these process tools and pipelines. It's time for the part you've all been waiting for, which is to see the monthly progress on our gameplay. So last time we spoke, I was showing you our Unity prototype that we had in January. Uh, we chose Unity as our starting engine, at least for the programmers, because they were able to quickly flesh out the mechanics that we wanted to have in the game in that engine so we could test how they felt, if we liked them, what needed to be changed, etc., before moving into Unreal. So we had some simple R mechanics, some simple UI and AI, and just your basic programmer art. But like I said earlier in the presentation, we were able to move along successfully from Unity to Unreal. So now we're going to show you our vertical size demo. Function F8. And duplicate. And click away. OK. So we're going to hit the play button in just a second. Uh, it's going to trigger a cinematic that's going to show you the first two rooms of our level with full set decoration. Now, you saw those two rooms in the overhead, but now you're going to be able to see it with all of the art, the finalized art in place. So go ahead and hit play.
So welcome to Copper Wealth Mine. Uh, this is the first level of our game. It takes place in an abandoned mine shaft uh, that has recently taken up some new residents. The Bandito clan we were telling you about earlier have made their new home in here. Motor is currently tracking them down to locate his lost arm, and he is here on a mission to find them and bring them to justice. So given that this is an abandoned mine shack, uh, it's starting to decay. You can see that we have some rust like on all these metal pieces here. And um, you can notice that nature is starting to retake this scene as well. So we're going to go ahead and hit start and enter the level. So go ahead and take a look around this room. So as a team, we decided that one of our ultimate goals is going to be to publish to Steam. And as a result, since we are a small team with a limited art budget, we decided that the pieces that we built in our world had to have some modularity associated with them. Modularity was really important to us because it enables us to build several pieces that can dynamically be placed in scene to make set pieces that feel dynamic and unique from one another. So we're going to go ahead and take another look around this room, and then we're going to come up on our first platforming section. This area of the game is pretty simple. It's just meant to tutorialize the player to get them used to how it feels to just do your basic walking and jumping. So Aaron, whenever, you're, whenever you feel ready, let's go ahead and hop over to those stairs to the next section. OK. As we turn the corner here, you can see some of what I was talking about in terms of nature taking back over. There was a little bit of a cave-in happening up here, so you can notice that sand is starting to pour back into these mines. And areas where the light is hitting, you can see that we have vegetation growing in those places. So this next jump is also going to be a little bit too, uh, you can't make this jump with just a single jump. It's going to take a double jump to make it across. So let's go ahead and give that a try, Aaron. Single jump doesn't do it, so we make our way back around, and there we go, we got it. This next jump is going to require a double jump not to move horizontally, but vertically. You're going to need to make your way on top of this platform here, so give it a shot. Okay, now the next thing we want to point your attention to right here is, are these rail tracks that you see here. So you can notice that there was a cave-in on one path, so the player knows that there's no way they can move down there, as well as an area that's been completely sealed off, likely because of the destruction that's happened in the area. Another thing to pay mind to is we mentioned vertex painting earlier and how it allows our level designers to paint along paths that the players are, going, are supposed to be following. So here we were able to paint along a rock path that leads you to this first platform so the player is naturally kind of guided to where it is they need to be. This section is right now the most complicated platforming section that you've seen so far insofar as if you fail to make this jump, you'll fall and you have to do it over again. But still, you have limitless strides to be able to do it, so Arian, go ahead and do your best. Oh no, it's okay, because he's able to do this as many times as it takes, just to get used to the feel of platforming and double jumping. Okay, so now as we come up in this next area, this is a jump that's going to be too large for the player to naturally be able to make it across. Go ahead and give it a try. Robots don't like water, so the second he made contact with the water down there, he was instantly teleported to be back here. So now we're going to talk a little bit about our icons and what they mean in the game. So in the center here, you can see our player's reticle. And this is where the character is currently aimed at. So if he were to shoot right now, it would go right in the middle of that reticle. Go ahead and try it. Just like that. Now, when your reticle gets near an object with one of these white dots over here, it means that it is an object you can interact with. So notice what happens as a reticle gets close to this piece. OK, we can see that we have a red reticle on the outside and a blue reticle on the inside. A red one indicates that this object can be shot with your gun. A blue one indicates that you can grab it with your arm. And notice how your icon doesn't even need to necessarily be overlaid with it in order to make that contact. That's because we're intending a lot of dynamic movement in this game, and we don't want players to feel like the game was too precise and they, they missed the important thing that they needed to grab or shoot. So right now what we're going to do is we're going to extend our arm onto that metal beam, and we're going to try to contract and pull ourselves into it so we can make it across. Just like that, we have now made it safely across. The next thing I want to point your attention to here are these oil geysers. While this may have the appearance of being a set piece built with multiple different uh, ge oil geysers, this is in fact one object that we've been able to scale and rotate in just such a way that it creates a unique set piece. This plays back to the modularity necessity with our art assets that we were telling you about earlier. So even in the instance here where this particular geyser was stretched upwards, notice how we didn't lose any of the resolution with our texture. And the reason why is because our textures are scaling in, regard, in relation to the world space. So we don't have those same kinds of problems. Now we're going to go ahead and descend down on this pole. We're also trying to do a little bit of storytelling with our level design as well. So you can infer naturally that at one time these two tracks met. They no longer do. If we look over here, we can see that a minecart has fallen over, collapsing some of this uh, railway. 
And something interesting with these rails is that one of our artists built a spline tool that enables us to essentially place our rails on that and be able to distort and manipulate the railing however we need to within our world. So now we're going to go ahead and turn around. Notice this radical appeared on screen. What this means is that there is an object that Motor can currently grab onto even though, his, even though the camera is not currently facing it, but because he is facing it. So go ahead and extend your arm. As we can see, he has now made contact with an object. So if we turn our camera over, we can see what it is he's grabbed. It's another one of those uh, metal pieces that he grabbed onto earlier. So now we can infer that if we contract our arm, we're going to pull ourselves into that object. OK, excellent. And on that note, we are now going to be leaving our beautiful set rest area, and we're going to be entering white box world. So as we walk through this archway, we're going to go ahead and it's going to trigger a cinematic. OK, so what we just saw there was one of those TN toads, unfortunately, collapsing the way forward. So we're now we're going to have to find another way around. So if we look to our left, we can see that there's a boulder that's blocking this stairway right here. So what we're going to have to do is grab one of these TN toads that's across the bridge, and we're going to have to employ one of our new mechanics we've added this month. So what that new mechanic is is stiffening. What that essentially means is that at any stage during you contracting something in or extending away, you can lock your arm in place and hold whatever object it is you were grabbing onto. So we are essentially going to be grabbing this from across the chasm and placing that bomb frog right next to this boulder, blowing it up. Go ahead and give it a shot. He locked his arm in place, and he's now able to transfer it right over there, and it exploded. And now we're able to find another way around. So in this section, Aaron can keep double jumping to make it over these stairs. That's his, that's his call if he wants. But we also place another one of these metal pieces to pull yourself over. We're trying to build the idea in the player's head that these won't always be necessary for you to make forward movement. But sometimes that efficiency feels really, really good. So we want to be able to have these set up throughout the world. So go ahead and pull yourself up and save yourself some time. Just like that, we're at the top of the stairs in record time. All right, so now we're coming up on two more of those TN toads that we saw earlier. Uh, you can eliminate enemies in a number of ways, but first we're going to start with something basic. Let's just, let's just shoot them a few times. Let's take them out with a gun. OK, so that first one is out. And for this next one, we're going to show you how you can extend your arm to crush something against a wall. So he's going to grab this frog, and he's going to shove it into the back wall. Just like that, he was crushed. And he exploded based on that physical impact. So now that eliminated all the threats in the area, we're going to go ahead and descend these stairs now. And as we make it down to this bottom step, this is the end of the canyon sec. This is essentially the end of the demo that we promised we'd be showing for Vertical Slice. But we've also been developing another room that we would like to show you that imbues some of our AI, some of our level design considerations. And, and we're also going to be showing you some new mechanics in this new space. So let's go ahead and turn around and let's go a little deeper into these mines. So first, we're going to talk a little bit about the Bomb Frog AI. There are a few ways that you can get him aggravated at you. One is to grab him. Another is to shoot, which will get just about anyone's attention if you shoot them. And the other is to walk into his line of sight. Thus, he sees you, and now he's mad at you. And as far as his explosion goes, he either explodes on a six-second timer, or if he collides with the player, he will explode on impact. So let's go ahead. Get his attention and have him explode. He sees you. He touched you. And then he exploded. And the next section we're over here, we're going to talk about group AI. And in this case, it is the idea that if you annoy one of these frogs, the others, and the others that are near it are going to start to come after you as well. So go ahead and get one of their attention. And let's see what happens. And now Arian has a problem. Uh, we're trying to make it so that way you can't just snipe out enemies. You have to be able, this is a combat game. You, you have to be involved in these set pieces. We also want the AI to feel a little believable too. So we're going to turn our attention to this. Uh, you can't make this with a double jump but you can uh, pull yourself up there. So we want to get the player used to the idea that you're not just going to be using this tool to help you get across chasms, but also to ascend vertically as well. So go ahead and pull yourself up. All right. Now as we walk around this corner, uh, we can see that there's some grabbable objects up on that balcony over there. So let's go ahead and try to pull ourselves up there. OK, so what we had there was a light object. We've identified those at this point, that a light object is going to come to you. OK, let's try the next one. That was a little closer this time. What you saw was a medium weight object. So you guys met in the middle. But there has to be another way on top of that balcony. Well, as we were entering this cave, you may astute players may have noticed that we had a secret tunnel just to the left-hand side. So we're going to go ahead and uh, walk back to the entrance and try to find that tunnel. And we can pull ourselves up. 
So something we're trying to do with our level design is make sure that our levels have enough of these little secret paths that stray away from the golden intended path so players can feel a sense of like reward and uh, f like feeling that you're, they're solving secrets to the game. So over here is another one of those cacti that we've been able to grab throughout our level. Uh, but we can see that there's no icon over it. There's nothing indicating that we can interact with it in any way. And the reason being is because we're currently too far away from it. So if Arian wants to make it all the way to this end of the level, he's going to have to get a jumping start and then pull himself midair. Go ahead. OK. Just like that, we're on the other side of the map. All right. The next thing we want to show you now, we've talked about how bullets can magnetize electric, or I'm sorry, they can magnetize metal surfaces. Uh, so, but we haven't yet demonstrated that in any of our demos. So now we would like to, we're going to operate under the assumption that this white cube right here is a metal object. Go ahead and shoot it a few times. And just like that, they get sent flying to it. And since these, are, these frogs explode when they've taken enough collision damage, they blew up right on that impact. But we, we can also magnetize an object and send it flying to enemies as well, which we're going to demonstrate for you right here. Just like that, we're able to send the magnet at them. Now, the next thing we want to show you in here is a super move that we've actually been developing this past month. So if you look over here, you can see these orbs that are floating in the air. These spawn every time you defeat an enemy. And if you collect them, you start to build up a meter that enables you to do a super move. So in this next section we're going to be presenting, Arian is going to enter a uh, super move state where the screen is going to flicker and become dark. And he's going to be able to shoot up to six enemies at a time. And then with the press of a button, he can detonate and all of them are going to explode. So let's go ahead and try that. And there's our game logo indicating that uh, you've currently locked onto something. And the game slows down too. And he turned away because cool guys don't look at explosions. You just, you can't. It breaks all the rules of reality. Okay. So now we have one last section that we want to show you before we go back to the PowerPoint, uh, just behind this wall over here. Similarly to our Unity demo where we had a playground of sorts, where we had a bunch of moving interactable pieces in that last section, we're going to have another one of them just past this wall. So I'm not going to tell Arian what to do at all. He can interact with this upcoming scene in any way he wants, and then we're going to be moving back to the presentation for just a little bit more information. See, this is an instance where you would want to have that aim assist if you're flying around. That's fine. We could have got more, but whatever. All right. On that note, we're going to go ahead and uh, change it back to the PowerPoint. OK. So now, the last bit of information we need to break down with you. We're going to talk our future plans. Our next milestone presentation is going to be on March 28th. And by then, our designers are going to have finished up the mines up until the boss fight, and also present a full design for what that boss is going to be. Programmers are going to implement two more enemy AIs and build tools for tech and level designers to more easily create levels with interactable objects inside of them. Artists are going to be finishing the frog enemy, the block out of the miner, have some new environmental assets in for the level designers, and finish the protagonist's model. And on that note, we are Quality Games, and we will see you next month. There it is. <laughs> So great work. Um, I feel like the, this showed not only a lot of artistry to give us confidence, but also a lot of gameplay so that we could feel like the team can move along. Some of my specific notes, um, I, I like the, uh, the small, medium, large that you have going on. I think there are occasions where objects might be nearly medium looking or nearly large looking, because there's really a spectrum, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think uh, I would encourage you to make 
uh, your own visual language of certain kinds of objects that are only going to be small. Right now you have some confusion in the sense that a cactus is normally medium, but then if it's just the cactus head, it's actually small. So now I see this green cactus, and I'm thinking, oh, that's medium, cool. It's like, oh, that was only a cactus head. Oh. Right? So I think that that's a point of confusion for players. Okay. It makes sense if cacti, okay. cacti are medium, period, period. Because why would you need to reuse them for small? That can and should be something else. It's definitely a different color. Mm -hmm. It look very, very different. And, uh, and try your best not to mix and match. And if you have to, like if you really need to do a really big cactus, make it discolored from the other cacti so that it helps cue us in that that's actually a large object rather than a medium. So that consistent visual language is huge to allow players to operate intuitively. Um, uh, you're using a kit-based level design, and I think that's the right approach. We saw two rooms. How many total are you planning to do? Uh, Matt, do you happen to remember how many? Uh, 20, uh, 20 between now and August. You showed two, and you plan to do 20. Yes. Uh, using the pipeline that we established there, uh, we believe that in 20 weeks we can get up to 20. So it took you four weeks to do two? Um, it took us to get everything up to that level. It, did, it took us. Um, it did take us uh, four weeks to do two, but several of our assets are reoccurring, and so um, we're taking. We're making the assumption that every level will require less less assets than the last one did. Right, but by twofold would would be remarkable. So I wouldn't assume that you can do one a week, since it took two weeks to do one. You'll get some savings, but it's not. Probably multiplier two. I would imagine so. Twenty sounds like a lot, and so yes, yeah, so at least if you're kit based, I think that will help. So no problem with that. That doesn't include the ones we already have. So eighteen. Um, I like the playful tone of the presentation. That that you were kind of joking, and, and there's a light tone. I thought that was great. That was, you said that, Jake, and I thought that was that served you well. Um, you showed a bunch of numbers for asset projections, but then you never said if that met your needs. Like, is this what we actually need? Like, oh, we can make seventy widgets and. 42 doodads, like how many doodads do you need? And so um, you need to compare and contrast that against what your projections are. I assume that you showed those numbers because that was what you wanted to produce and you were showing mm -hmm. that you could produce that. Is that true? Yes. Okay, we'll just make that clear because you, you only said what you were able to produce rather than what your targets were, and those were the same. Great. No, I'm, no. Uh, there's a question. Um, cool uh, visual target video that you had um, where you're kind of panning around there in the mind. I'm, I'm very, very proud of the team of already deciding that you're going to aspire to Steam. That's fantastic, right? <clears throat> we, there's not a whole lot to say about that yet during pre pro because it's pre pro um, But as you run along, there'll be a lot more to say about that and feedback. But I, I heavily admire you that you're, you're aiming towards it. That's awesome. Um, I love it. Um, the introducing the TNT tool by blowing up the bridge was brilliant. That was a really, really clever way to introduce it, showed how it works, but also create the peril of, oh, there's a bridge I could have crossed and now I can't. So that ties into the puzzle. That's really, really thoughtful. Um, once the grapple locks in place, can you retract or re-extend it again? So once you grab an object, you can cancel it and it'll just come back to you. And then if you contract the arm or extend the arm, it's based off the weight of the mass stuff. So, so grab the little TNT frog yeah. that comes in too close. Yeah, I can stiffen it and then I can push it away from me and I can stiffen again. So stiffen was a mechanic we talked about where you can lock the distance. If I lock the distance, I can then extend again and lock it again or contract it okay, again. So and lock it. Yeah. Okay, good, because then you'll need to be able to do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Fine tuning what you want to do. What are you calling that feature of the grapple? A feature of the, the grapple? Just grabbing it because it's meant to be like almost like a sticky hand type thing, like a magnetic yeah, hand. Yeah, so you'll to lock it and then yeah. extend and retract. What are you calling that? The, the locking itself is stiffening, so like your arm becomes like. Stiff and it yeah, it, it stops doing this. It just locks wherever it is. Yeah, so so in light stiff objects, in. you it, you'll keep it at that distance, and a, and a large object since you can't push it, it will, you'll be stuck at that distance, so you can't even approach a heavy object. Okay. Um, did the player have to discover that secret chamber in order to move forward with the progress? No. So it was an, an, another way to get up. What was the regular way to get up? Oh, to get up there. There's another entrance in the back that you can go around. But they're both kind of secret. They're not necessarily, yeah. Yeah, one secret and one not so secret. OK. Yeah, because yeah. two secret, I think you can see why that's a challenge. That's a problem. Um, that cactus that you ended up grabbing once you were up higher, could I have reached that from down below from the get-go? Uh, from down below? Uh, from the balcony? I don't think so. From, you're saying from on the floor? So you went the secret passage, you got up high, yeah. and then you grabbed the cactus. Could I just grab that cactus from down below? If you would have gotten close enough, yeah. 
okay, problem, right? Because if I could just do that, then what's the point of being able to only get it from, the, from that other area? The secret chamber was now useless to me. I can get what I was going to get without having used it. Uh, yeah, I mean, the secret chamber is to show the the idea that we can yeah. hide things. It wasn't like that room is not yeah. final. Like that there, that there was there could be a collectible up there. There could be a bunch of other things up there. The the idea was that you could also use this sort of running, jumping head start to close distances and not necessarily strictly that the cactus was solely there for the back. It's just right. But if, if you're if you're trying to create artwork that looks final and as part of a vertical slice, then it's the same judgment criteria that we would apply to game design, level design, and so forth. Okay. So you, you can't say, oh yeah, here's the art. It, we, we feel it looks good, give us feedback. And then not expect us to give feedback on the game design and level design concepts as well. Everything's supposed to be good in the vertical slice. Mm. You show a small piece, but everything's good. Yeah. So I'm going to give you level design comments. Um, um, two last comments, and then I have a set of small, little nitpicky art things that I'll talk about later. Okay. Um, that super move, it didn't feel like a super move until you did the time slow on the big swing around thing. Mm -hmm. And so then I think it kind of pays for itself, because otherwise it's just why would I just shoot the, the things <clears throat> than shooting them with a detonation that happens later. So I think that the slow motion is the superpower. <clears throat> don't, don't forget that. It's not that I can <clears throat> blow up things later. The slow mo is the superpower. Unless, of course, you tag something to blow up and then it moves somewhere that I can't make it go, and then I blow it up. Like, oh, that's a super move. Great. So I just encourage you to, to really see where you're getting the value for your super move. Because having things blow up slightly later than they would if I just shot them regularly wouldn't really be all that empowering. It might look cooler with the explosion and so forth, but I'd say that's more style than a super move that enables you to do superhuman things. And my last comment is that that, that swing that you had around the yeah. cactus, that, that idea, that was glorious. That was amazing. And that points to how cool um, and how high-powered and heavily octane this game could be. And so I love that you finally got to a glory moment like that I can really, really sink my teeth into. Because uh, up to that, it was rather tutorial, which is great, it's fine, mm -hmm. but I was I was eager to see something that would blow me away yeah. even though this game had promised, and then you did that. So. Yeah, and that was our rationale for including that sequence, too. We wanted to make sure that the feel of the game is featured in this. Cool, great, thanks. Yeah, I'm trying to get to real quick here. Um, been a long time. I thought it was lots and lots of improvement from last time, even though I, I thought it was pretty good last time, but it's a lot better now. So I think you guys have made a ton of improvement in all the right directions. Uh, loved what you did with your level. Um, uh, I loved uh, some of your tools and the way you're making everything modular. I uh, loved some of the set decoration, like the sand waterfall and stuff, some really cool stuff there. Um, I think you could do a little bit more to bring life to the world. It's always a challenge, especially when you're in a desert environment, to try to make it alive and make things move. You know, I saw, okay, we saw a little dust and a little uh, sand waterfalls and some bubbling uh, uh, oil pits, but like, yeah, it's uh, going to get old fast, so you got to find new ways to do it. I'm sure you'll think of it, but uh, right now it still feels like there's a little bit of work left to be done to kind of really give it that last spark and bring it to life. It's a really good start, though, so I, I, I like the direction. I love the new mechanics. Uh, this idea of the stiffening arm is uh, a new one from last time, which is really cool. Um, you know, the, the shooting while you're swinging in a big uh, 360 is uh, obviously this sort of uh, coup de grace that kind of really sealed it. Um, I'll say that um, <clears throat> my, my uh, biggest criticisms, which aren't very big, uh, but really are, are sort of in the strategic uh, arrangement of the presentation itself. You know, I'm, I'm a big believer in start, uh, you know, start off by putting rose-colored glasses over your audience, and, and so you had like some really cool stuff, and they kind of all sort of, and the art was good, but it was like not at the front, and then the really cool stuff swinging at the end was really good, mm -hmm. but like, uh, as Ron said, it was kind of like ho-hum until we got to like that, and we're like, oh my god, this is so freaking cool, and I, I feel like you could have actually started the audience off on a, on a, on a stronger note by showing the really cool stuff, like front-loading it. It's, it's, it's a matter of taste. Different people are going to have different opinions on that. That's just, that's just mine. Uh, instead, kind of on the front end, you gave us uh, about 90 seconds of uh, metrics collection, <laughs> which is not the most exciting thing to start on. Um, so it was interesting. I thought the metrics collection thing went on a bit long. I, I'm, I, I'm glad to see it because, you know, I'm a process junkie, but uh, maybe a bit long. I understood why you were using it to, um, to justify your, your uh, asset estimates and stuff like that. So it served its purpose, but it, it could have been a touch uh, a, a touch shorter. Okay. Uh, but I mean, overall, this is just like fabulous, and you guys should really be proud of yourself. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Good job. Good job. Uh, and, uh, five minutes and, uh, oh yeah.
lead on Project IMP. Instead of boring you right away with some numbers and graphs, we're actually going to go right into the most exciting stuff right now. So that was our vertical slice. Um, now we're going to look at some things more closely. So if you can go back down on the ground. 
So something that we were hugely focused on besides visual target was our locomotion and how Scamp feels along with his core mechanic. A big thing that went into that was his animation. So you can see his full body is more the traditional keyframe animation, but if you look at his ears and his tail, they actually operate a little bit differently. So if you zoom in and you aim and you strafe left to right, you can see how his ears and his tail follow him as well as, you, as if you just like kind of run around in a circle. So run around in a circle, Dan. You can see how his tail kind of follows him. So that's actually done with a, uh, a trail controller instead of being keyframed, and that helped us in multiple different ways. So one thing, it saved time, because we didn't have to go in and keyframe every single animation, but it actually also created a more fluid um, look and the tail and the ears actually following Scamp. Plus, it's actually a less performance cost, so that's always a plus. Um, some other things I wanted to show you was camera work. Um, so we have our own cameraman, Dennis, who's really interested in doing all this camera work. So if you see, Scamp jumps, he lands. You can It's really subtle, but the camera kind of shakes a little bit, and that helps add to Scamp's bounciness and his um, momentum feel, as, long, as well as if you're running. So start running, Dan. And then if you jump, jump, double jump, the camera ever so slightly lags, and that also helps with his momentum and his jumpy feel. Um, some other things I wanted to point out in this level is that our TDs and our programmers also worked closely with our level designers to kind of help speed along the process. So, for example, a lot of the trigger boxes from the chest to the tiny doors that you saw closed to the bat particle effect a lot, and actually the, blueprint, the blueprints, the rocks floating around the islands, they actually all move on their own and their own axis. Um, those were really done by um, a programmer. And then something I mentioned in the last presentation was this really cool enemy um, blueprint. So what happens is they follow a spline, so you can custom create that spline, rotate it however you want it to be. So if you look up at the roof, all of those uh, wisp enemies are actually operating on their own separate spline. And all the wisps were actually able to be implemented between five to 10 minutes because of that cool uh, blueprint that we had. So now Dan can, is actually gonna go back up to the doors. He's gonna go through them. And then we have a little, just a play box area to kind of show you what else we've been working on behind the scenes. Dan can get up there. <laughs> you designed this game. You designed this. <laughs> So here's our little playground. Um, you've already seen the wisp enemies, so now we've started experimenting with a uh, little more complex ways to use the wisp enemies, but here's just more of a basic. So obviously he can't go over there. So the wisp enemies eat um, your magical orb when you throw it, but they also eat, like let's say your orb gets by them and you're able to spawn your clone. The wisp enemy will also go and eat the clone image. So either way, they're gonna track it down and eat it. So you have to go around. So same thing, on the left there was a wisp that you can't get by. So he'll eat it no matter what. So this is going to demonstrate exactly about how far up Scamp can get. So he's got about two throws, one, two. So now we've also started looking at different ways that the environment can be introduced and in different environmental effects and how they um, interact with Scamp. So this is a kind of like a bounce pad, essentially, um, but a wisp is blocking it, so there's literally no other way to get through, except you have to get on the bounce pad, it bounces you up. This is another cool thing we've been looking at. Um, so essentially, this is like a barrier. Um, it only allows magic through it, so you won't be able, Scamp himself will not be able to traverse through. So, but remember, the orb will bounce off any surface that isn't walkable. Once it lands on a walkable surface, then it'll spawn the teleportation point. So he bounced the orb off and then got through. And then another area is, um, so his clones are also affected by the environment just like he is. So when the, go ahead and bounce. So his clone's gonna spawn over the bounce pad or on it. And so actually it'll also be affected by the bounce pad. And that's another way we've been looking at um, using the environment. This is the really primitive um, fireball wizard that we just started working on. Um, those little things that are spawning are mana crystals that we'll get into later. Um, he's getting mana crystals because he's successfully dodging the enemy attacks. Um, but once he's charged through, he's gonna go ahead and 
place a clone behind the enemy and then teleport through them and that acts as, a, as an attack and as you can see he died. Um, a cool thing to note about our combat is we didn't want to be the typical hack and slash because again you know we are a platformer so we wanted um, kind of combat to reflect the platforming skills um, versus just actual combat. So a lot of it is positioning based and using those platforming skills. And so now we'll go ahead and dive back into the presentation. <clears throat> okay. So we know that we're streaming this today, so I'm sure a lot of alumni are looking in. We know they didn't see our previous presentation, so we're going to do just a quick mini cap recap. Um, so this is kind of a little bit of our backstory. You see the big hats, big problems. Those are kind of our enemies. This is our main character. Um, little backstory is that Scamp is a familiar that was summoned by his master wizard. Unfortunately, his master wizard has been kidnapped by this group of radical underground reclusive wizards. So now Scamp has been tasked with going to save his wizard. So you kind of saw a lot of the main me um, mechanics in our game. We are a 3D action platformer with the emphasis on the, pla on the platforming. We're a whimsical, playful game. We don't take ourselves too seriously. The world is kind of your magical playground. Um, our vertical slice goals that you just saw, our main one was a visual target. And then second to that was uh, Scamp's main core mechanic and basically just getting his locomotion to feel really smooth and great. So what went into this vertical slice? Tons and tons of artwork. So first, um, we're going to be upfront about it. We had to use some things from asset packs, but we want to be clear on what those things were. These are the exact things that we took out of, mo uh, out of asset packs that we did not modify um, or change. Um, this kind of helped um, our process because we only had about three weeks to get this all together, so this helped us move along. But on this next slide, these are the things that we took out of asset packs and actually um, heavily modified. They don't look anything like they did in the asset pack. But now we're going to show you all the stuff that we made on our own. So here's the first slide. You saw Scamp in there. You saw kind of the platforms, um, a lot of the uh, environment assets and the hero assets. And we can go to the next slide. We also made all of these. You saw all of these, so won't go into each and every one. And then um, <clears throat> these are also some other things that we made. This is cool. This is a smart material. So this is another um, way that we kind of set up things to be a really smooth process. So within seconds, you can kind of change the color of the glow, how often it pulses, how long it remains lit. Um, that waterfall we also made. And then a cool thing about the bat particle effect is that it also follows its own spline that you can dynamically change. And then you can also decide how many bats are spawning, um, how big they are. They each can actually rotate on their own. So that's a really cool, um, unique way to do that. Um, another thing that our artists were heavily involved in was lighting. We learned that lighting takes forever. The amount of time that we all spent waiting, waiting on lighting to build is ridiculous. So one thing that we noticed is that, so you know when you start a UE4 map, they kind of give you this all around the world lighting and it's the ambient lighting and it looks kind of bad and it was washing out a lot of our textures, a lot of our materials, um, the shadows weren't very crisp. So we didn't like that. So instead we went ahead and deleted it all and we started placing point light here, spotlight there and started bringing light into the world. Um, to get what you saw today. And then we also have um, an issue with dealing with Scamp's shadow. So going forward, what we want to do actually is attach a light to Scamp. And that way, that is the only lighting that is affecting Scamp and casting his shadow. Um, <clears throat> the cool thing about that is because we want to go further and actually make it dynamic. So if Scamp goes into a dark area versus a light area, that light over him casting the shadow should dynamically change as fit. So here's um, some of the animations that Brian did. Um, these are really cool because you can see um, we actually went ahead and got his strafing left and right animations, but these are the state machines that we had to use. And those, those are really important to us because Scamp is constantly moving around in the air so much and switching between different animations. So there needs to be a smooth transi transition, for example, when he's running into jumping, into that double jump, but what if he casts and then he jumps again and then he lands? All of those need to blend seamlessly together. So this state machine was crucial. And then we have this guy that is animated it's important to note that stretchy spine that we showed you in the last presentation is actually implemented into the chest. We, going forward, we want to implement it into Scamp and then in the first uh, humanoid enemy that we'll be showing you later. <clears throat> so now we're going to kind of look at the back end and what tech's been up to. It's important to note um, that when we say tech, we mean TDs and, producer, er, and programmers because they collaborate very closely together on a lot of these projects. 
So a brief overview on um, some of the things that they were really involved in was optimization and obviously critical bug fixing. Bug fixing is you know, obvious, but optimization is really important because again, we're a portfolio and production value piece. So when the minute we would have the FPS drop, the programmers would be on it and fixing it that day. It's really important for us because we want to be able to push the engine to its limits. As you saw our vertical slice, we want the world to feel live. So there's a lot of particle flex effects, a lot of different kind of lighting and all of those things. And we didn't know exactly how much of it we can do without affecting the engine. Um, Scamps locomotion, again, you've heard me say this, this is really important. This was about a huge three-week um, iterative process, a lot of experimentation with different speed, um, <clears throat> speed numbers, a lot of different jump heights, um, how high should his double jump V versus his regular jump. So <clears throat> that was definitely a huge process that our TDs and programmers were in on. And like I said before, we have our own cameraman. Something I was pointing out in the vertical slice is easier to see here. So as he's jumping, if you look at the back wall and you look at the vertical lines, it's a lot easier to see how they move. Um, <clears throat> a lot of those subtleties didn't come you know, right away. So that was about a three week process of Dennis experimenting with different camera angles. How much should the player be able to move the camera? How quick, um, all of these little shaking effects. Um, that was also a huge iterative process for us. And these things I actually pointed out to you in the vertical slice, so I'm not going to go over them in detail again, but we just wanted to put it here to kind of show you in total what our programmers and TDs have been up to. So now we're going to get into design. Um, obviously, for our vertical slice, level design was also a huge deal. Um, we're going to show you where we kind of started. This is our super, super primitive white box. That's where it started. You can see it's very symmetrical. Um, the angle's a little bit different than you saw today. And then going forward, something that we were trying to look at was tackling these huge rock walls because our artists and our level designers are like a little bit nervous about how to tackle such a big space. Um, so then we kind of got the first rock acid and you can see it's red. We definitely ended up changing that. Um, <clears throat> and then this next picture is about the last picture that we have until what you see today. So that was a huge iterative process as well. And then um, <clears throat> for the alumni watching, you kind of saw his his core mechanic in the vertical slice, but in case anything was a little bit unclear, um, basically he can throw his image and then he can teleport to those things. Um, he can pop his orb in midair and teleport to that. Um, the way combat works, again, very um, platform skill based instead of the typical hack and slash. So you have to position yourself correctly in front of the enemy with your image behind him and teleport through the enemy. Um, I put this here because combat's going to be a huge focus for us in March because you know now we've kind of gotten his main mechanic and his locomotion down pat. Now we're going to start adding a next layer. Another thing we want to look at in March that we've already begun thinking about is UI. Um, we don't want the screen to be too cluttered and break immersion, so we're thinking about um, a health bar, a mana bar, and maybe some kind of information to convey to the player how many images they have left and how many they can use. Another cool thing to note that um, during our vertical slice that you saw, the background music was made by a professional composer, um, a contact through Drury. Drury did help um, <clears throat> arrange it. Another cool thing, um, we actually recorded the effects for the chest and the tiny doors that were closing. Those were done by wonderful Brian. And then um, the rest of it, though, was not made by us. So in the future, um, levels now that we're looking at is the caverns, um, which you kind of already saw a lot of. Um, we're actually just going to be expanding on that. And then the library level and then a twilight zone. So one last thing to note about for the design end, we have a lot of these one page designs up in our backlog. Um, <clears throat> this has helped because it's uh, kind of kept the gears turning so we're not ever hitting um, you know, a slow spot with coming up with new ideas. Obviously, we're not looking to implement all of these. This is just to, again, keep the gears turning and coming up with more and more creative ideas. So now we're going to get into the fun part, like Jake said, sexiest part, management time and into graphs. So now you're going to see. Um, <clears throat> these are the total hours that we put in. Again, it's important to note that programming also includes the TDs. It's not just, that's why design's a little bit lower. Um, we told you last time that our meeting hour number was actually higher than this, and we told you that that was going to hopefully lower our meetings in the future and bug fixing. And good news is that it did, um, because we were able to set a lot of constraints and kind of get the top of the pyramid set in stone about what we wanted to do and what we were making, and making sure that everyone was on the same page. So that did work out, because look at how low our meetings are in bug fixing. Um, here you're going to see more of a day-to-day -day of how February went and how many hours people put in. Good news is that we still kind of kept the Sundays low like we wanted to, but you will notice that this a little bit lower than this, and then this is a little bit lower than that. And we realized why was because in the beginning of Vertical Slice, 
people were really nervous about, oh my gosh, there's so much expected of us. We only have about three weeks. How are we going to get all of this done? So, but right about here is when we started getting in assets. And then the world started coming to life. The level was coming along well. And then people started getting really excited about the game. And then here it was just so much enthusiasm that people were just throwing things in engine left and right. And we really, really picked up um, productivity, especially a cute little story is that when people would come and like test our game, they'd be playing around in it. They would, you know, do the whole level, do the little puzzle, and then they would go back down to the ground and just run in circles and jump around. And we would have to be like, hey, can you give us the controller? Because it's just so much fun to move with Scamp. And once the team started seeing that, that just the enthusiasm went through the roof. And then um, kind of what's on the plate for March. So like I said, we're going to be focusing on combat. We're wanting to get a fireball wizard, so our first humanoid enemy. Um, the model complete and the texture, along with his AI, actually perfected and completed. And then we also wanted a first pass at the full caverns. It's important to note it's not going to be polished like this vertical slice, but we want to get a first pass at it. <clears throat> And then little things for that is um, like Katarina is really interested in implementing an auto rigger. That way, uh, future enemies can be way more easily um, <clears throat> rigged and little things like that. And then this is just a really brief overview of what we expect the entire capstone to look like. Obviously, you see how long we expect production to be versus alpha, um, when we expect our first playable to be ready. Um, we kind of started looking at our focus tests and when we're going to spread out those and the best time for those. So I wanted to bring back this slide, because this is what we promised you last month for Vertical Slice. This is the exact slide. We said that we would have a concrete visual target. We feel like we hit that. We said that we would have Scampin with his animations. Specifically, I said that he would have his movement animations, his jumping animations, and his uh, casting animations. But we actually got a lot of his strafing left and right animations, along with the mimic chest. We told you that we would have a textured Scamp. That's done. We told you that we would demonstrate Scamp's core mechanic. Done. And then we told you that we would introduce a complete enemy, and now our Wisp enemy is in there and we have already begun prototyping for the second enemy. Thank you for watching and we'll see you in March. Thank you. I thought uh, the game looks really nice. Um, Land with that for a reason. The game looks really nice. I think um, I don't want everybody to feel like I'm giving the opposite advice of Rick. <laughs> because I'm not. And I definitely agree with Rick that you start off your presentation with a bang. And I think that was a good move. Um, I think you could have started off with something other than the full demo and still gotten a big bang. Um, like if I had to go back in time, I would say, start off with a fly through of the scene and how cool it looks. And that's really the bang we made, is how cool that scene looks. Then talk about the mechanics and then show the demo. And the reason I think that would be better is because you talked about it after you did the demo. You said, I know there's a lot of people watching that haven't ever seen the game before. So let me explain the design to you. Mm -hmm. And that explanation would have been really handy when you were tra you know, traversing through the level. Even I was confused as to what was happening, and I was in that whole one, right? And so I think that that context can help make the, the visuals of what's going on during the demo make sense. And I think a lot of the people that hadn't seen it for the first time were confused about what makes this unique. I don't understand what's happening, really, right? Because you chose to kick off with the full demo. So in hindsight, I'm not sure that if your goal was to get people thinking about it critically that that was the best way to go. I do agree that it started off your presentation with a bang. The other downside of that is, is that the rest of the presentation was very dry and boring compared to that. Right? So you didn't really have too much else other than the explanations of how that came to be. So I think it's a, you know, you have a faculty advisor that believes in that, so that's how your presentations are going to be. You saw my team and my presentations. If I could change my presentation, I'd say, let's do the fly through and then talk and then show the full demo. But, you know, yeah. so, so I like how you let it off with some really nice looking graphics. Um, I thought that your cameras were super cool. Um, and they, they, the work on them shows. Um, and I, I think that you should continue to, to work on those because they're awesome. And the subtlety, oftentimes when you're, when you're polishing a game, the subtlety 
is where it's at and those show really, really well. It's a very polished piece of your game um, already. Think about how much time you have. So don't, don't think that those are done every time you add some cool mechanics. Give that level of polish to the cameras and that's, 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 that, that time is not wasted at all. Um, I thought it was a little weird how, how the trees were not affecting the player at all, yet they're, you know, they're a beautiful set piece and they really add a lot of color and vibrancy to your, to your scene. But then when, when the player was just flying right through them and things like that, that was a little bit off-putting. Is there any plans to have those animate or throw off particles or something to indicate that something is moving through them or no? I mean, we've begun looking at how, like, for example, for the mushrooms, um, we want them to start bouncing, so actually, like, bounce pads and different things. So now we're starting to look at um, how the environment pieces can affect Scamp and interact. So we're starting to look that into those things. kind of, like, flew through those and back and forth through them. That was really Yeah, hard. I see what you're saying. Yeah. Um, the other thing that was jarring, I noticed, was in your audio. Like, you would go from really low audio to really a lot of audio and back. So the audio transitions were really noticeable. So you may want to think about dealing with that logic when you can teleport so quickly and you have very realistic environment effects, those were jarring. Okay. Um, that's what you got there. Um, do you, so you outlined a lot of the assets that you use untouched. Mm -hmm. Do you plan on shipping them? Like is, are those final and you're shipping the assets that you never modified? Sh are, like you planning, are you planning on finishing this game and having those untouched assets in there? For the asset pack stuff? Yeah. No, we eventually it's going to be all of our own art. So, so you're modifying those as you go. Yeah. Okay. And then eventually those will all get replaced with our own from scratch art. Okay. So, okay, that's not what I was expecting to hear. So, like those trees that are in there, mm -hmm. sort of showing for vertical slice how beautiful this game looks. Mm -hmm. Those are being removed. Yes. Okay. To be replaced with our own art. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. I thought it was uh, strangely snarky to start your presentation the way that you did. <laughs> it felt like the slap in the face of the team before you. That's how it felt. That's how it read. But then you showed us graphs and numbers right exactly when they did in their presentation. I said I wasn't going to start. I said I wasn't going to start with that. Well, they didn't start with that. Though. Whatever. That, that, that was at the tail end of their presentation. Uh huh. Um, but okay, so, so I wasn't expecting to see any numbers and graphs in your presentation. So I was surprised to see that. Um, but are you planning on doing like a full analysis of your game? Like, here's how much gameplay we want, and here's why we think we can do that. Like, you showed a certain amount of gameplay, and you do you do kind of race through your game. Like, I'm trying to get a sense of just how much level you need, and and. Do you have the time to make that? And I'm the analysis you gave left me wanting. Like, like I don't really have a sense for just how many of these pieces you're going to have, and why I think you can make that many because this many took you that long. Okay, so you want more numbers on? No, I'm asking. Like, like how many of the, so that scene that we had that internal cabin? Yes. It was beautiful, right? Mm -hmm. Sort of objectively beautiful. Uh, <laughs> how many of those scenes do we have in this game? So that's why we showed you, um, so the level plan is the caverns, which is probably maybe another like two times that space for that full level, and then a library level, which will be about the same size. And I mean, this took us three weeks. So um, we, I'm not concerned with like, oh, we want 30 minutes of gameplay. It's more so about finishing and polishing one thing at a time and basically seeing how much we can do. That's why right now we just have the library expanding on the caverns and then the other thing that we had showed you. Like that's why right now we're just there because we want to get that polished first. So I'm not really like, I don't, we don't care as much about, oh, 40 minutes of gameplay or 20 minutes. Like right. instead we want it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think it's totally fine to not care about how much gameplay you're going to get. That's mm -hmm. totally fine. But I do think it's important at this point in development to be able to have a sense of how big of a game you can make based on um, how long things are taking you. I think your, your approach to the asset pack and the, your answer to the tree question leaves me doubly worried about, because you've got a beautiful environment that still needs to have a lot of work done on it, right? Because you've got to like replace those assets, right? So mm -hmm. that is a little, Leaves me a little bit wondering about how, how much you can make too. Um, 
I thought that I was really amazed by how much your character moves around and how much attention to detail there is on that. So awesome work. Like so much so that as you were playing it, I was like, I'm worried. So I've always been worried that the game doesn't seem very fun, but I never really worry about that because that gets answered in playtesting. Not, not by me or by Rick or by Ron, but by people playing the game, saying, is this a fun mechanic or not? Mm -hmm. And it looked very complete. Like your local motion and your animations, they looked really complete. And I was thinking, I wonder if they've even started having people test this. But then I saw on your schedule, your first test wasn't scheduled until May 7th. And it was like, wow, I would want this starting to get tested right now to see if this is fun. Because if it's not fun and you want to build out this mechanic, you're going to want to know that. That makes or sense. May 7th, yeah. Right? Yeah. Because you don't want to walk into that May 7th play test and go, oh, we found out that this whole throwing thing really needs to be redone because they're not finding it very intuitive or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. But you've got a lot of it already done. So why not do that earlier? I'm impressed with your progress on that whole animation, locomotion, jumping, throwing. Really, really great. I'd get that into testing sooner than okay. seven. Yeah. So, makes sense. Yeah. So I got. Good job. Thanks. Okay. Hi. Hey. Um, Project M. So I think you're, I'm already on, well on record <coughs> last time being a big fan of the big guy wizards. Thank you. So <laughs> none, we oh, I'm sorry. It's coming in March, March. I told you, March. Yes. <laughs> um, no, but I, I loved it, but, but more Big Head Wizards always true. Um, awesome transition. You got literally oohs and ahs from the, the crowd when you transitioned from your uh, the sketch that you had there, that little um, animatic, into the actual world. That was, uh, that was awesomely done. My second bullet was Jesus. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Impressed. Thank you. Um, I love the Venus loop track and the mushroom, the mini mushroom house. Um, there's, there's real comedy in there, a real playfulness to that. So I like the idea of that world coming to life. Please don't let it just die on the vine of, oh, we have these two cute gimmicks and that was the end of that. Because I see that pattern, you know, not only with capsules, but, you know, in industry release games where there's this really funny joke and a teaser. And it's like, yeah, that was, that was it. <laughs> Yeah, there. yeah. And then there's not, it's just kind of disappointing. So um, I think you have to keep working at that because you have to throw away 10 good ideas to find that one golden one. And the Venus loop grab was a golden one. Um, I like Scamp now. Like I, I told you at the, the beginning when you show all the concept art for Scamp, I, I saw a couple other versions of it and I'm like, oh, those are kind of cooler. But now that he's more fully realized, you've done him so well that now I like him. I don't even need to, or want to see the other versions. I don't care because he looks cool. I like him. So um, good to go. Uh, I do feel like there needs to be more precision on the transition into the teleporting, which is really hard because you're literally like zooming the camera over to this other place in the world. Like teleportation is always a tricky beast yeah. to do because it's so anti-physics, you know, <clears throat> and it literally warps our perspective, literally. So it's hard, and I, I'm on your side with that sympathy. But a lot of times it felt like you threw the teleport ball out there, and then I would zoom over kind of where it was going to be, and then always feeling like. I was a little bit behind it, and I don't know if that was intentional or not, but it just feel, felt to me like there was a lack of precision there, and I felt like I would be constantly missing the edge of cliffs because I thought I was going to go a little bit further than I did. But I, but I didn't play test it literally with the controller in my hand to evaluate that. So forget everything I just said. If people are playing it and they're getting it right, I'm just, as an observer, yeah. if it looked off. So I'm not sure if it needed to be that way gameplay-wise, but just, just be careful of that. Um, so I wasn't sure why the door ended up opening on, after you did that double teleport. I'm assuming that you needed to get onto those pressure plates quickly enough mm -hmm. in order to be able to open them. You're right. So I think that's just an issue of um, feedback with the sense that we can maybe hear the, the pressure plate depress a bit, and then when I leave it, we hear it extend back. Yeah. Like, oh, it's done. Not that it literally has to be a pressure plate that you push down on, but whatever it is, we have to get some kind of indication that, it, that it's quick that once you leave it, it resets. And that was the information I think I lacked in really understanding what was going on with that puzzle. And I think if you have that feedback and then you demonstrate the failure thereof, of, oh, we went to the other pressure plate. Well, we did it so slow, we heard the other one unsnap. It's like, oh, we gotta do this faster. Can we do double teleport? Actually, we can, let's do it. Or maybe on the door, you know, the door moves a little bit open and that's not enough for you to squeeze through. And you show us that, I can't get through. Like maybe I gotta go on two plates 
quickly for the door to get big enough. Whatever it is, you just need to communicate that a bit more, more solidly. The wisps are an awesome way to constrain your literal superpower of teleportation. So I thought that was clever in that they, they mess with the teleport ball, but they also mess with the teleport clone places. What are those called? The, oh, yeah, images. The images. The images. They mess with both of those, which is great, because then I think you have an awesome way to uh, pick your puzzles and constrain the, the power. Um, I think you have to be really careful in how you teach the player about the fact that they can't go through magical barriers, um, that the teleporting ball can, yeah. they can't. Yeah. Um, that's all a very tricky business, because you're li literally living in a supernatural world. And so it's kind of arbitrary when we invent those kind of constraints. So I would encourage you to ground it as much as possible. Same thing with the wisps. It shouldn't just be, shouldn't just be arbitrary that wisps mess up or eat teleport balls. That's literally what they should eat. They're this magical entity that literally survives on this as a nutrient. Um, and then that would even imply that you're incor incorporating teleport balls somehow into the environment itself, and that's how wisps normally live off of those. And then when you emit them, they go to pick them up, because that's literally what they eat. I think that'll be easier for players to grasp, and you'll be encouraged better with those mm -hmm. tutorials if you seek it into the world in a meaningful way, rather than just making an arbitrary rule. Wisp eat teleport ball. Why? Right? So I think that it's, it's good to make sure that you ground those ideas. Um, you showed solid depth on what you could do with puzzles once you went into the white boxing. You already saw one you know, kind of fresh play puzzle, but then you showed us some other variations of that, bouncing the teleport ball around as well. So I'm glad that you showed that depth. I would have complained about it if you hadn't shown me that. So. You dodged an arrow there. <laughs> um, the teleporting attack is clever in that you use the same teleporting mechanic. And you don't make it feel like it's dipping into kind of a shooter or a brawler, because this doesn't seem to want to be that. It doesn't need to be that. But I like that you reuse your teleport power, but still make it viable as an attack in combat. I would still say that that, I don't feel, is, is the, the mojo of your game. That the navigation itself and the, pu yeah. the puzzles are your mojo. And that the combat is probably ancillary to that. Who knows? Maybe you'll pro try some things, you prototype them out and love them, or play test them and they'll be a big hit, and then you can shift focus to the combat. That's fine. You know, you, you find your way in that design change as you go and you pivot as necessary. But for my money, I love the, the navigation and the puzzles themselves, and that I don't think you need to make tele combat um, <coughs> the breadwinner. Uh, could you clarify what assets you purchase? And yeah, uh, Tom already asked, are those going to be in the game? I think that's always a great thing to, to add. Whenever you use assets, yep, these are going to be in the game. We're going to publish with them, and, and, as opposed to, oh, we plan to replace them all, just so that we know where you stand and what you're planning to do, and we can kind of gauge what your art team is and is not working on. And the last thing I'd say is that this is like the Nightcrawler Origins game that I always wanted. Never <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, or Zazel, because he looks like a Zazel. You know. uh, so cool. I'm happy. I'm happy. We got our Jesus. Yeah. You turn off the mic here.
say that uh, right at the top, things have changed from our first update. We pretty much started from scratch, and so you're gonna you're gonna see our progress there. Uh, I want to say that we are no longer a uh, third-person action game. We are now a full-on action game. We are a 3D bullet hell game that takes place during one single boss fight. So right at the top here, I want to show a video from a a a video from a the game Dark Siders 2. It's just to set the tone about the, the that we're going for. Go ahead. So that's the tone we're going for. We want to we want to convey a sense of epic of epic trouble on a relentless scale, relentless trouble on an epic scale. <laughs> yeah. So let's talk about let's talk about Project Dragon. Okay. So Project Dragon is a high flying cinematic experience. It's hero versus boss as the player will relentlessly struggle to do damage, dodge attacks, and use a god's power against him. Uh, we we're projecting about a 10 to 15 minute play experience just to keep it fresh. So we call this our vertical slice presentation for our capstone game. But really what we're kind of looking at uh, capstone as is one big vertical slice for what a larger game could be. So imagine, imagine if, you know, instead of a, a game, a six hour gameplay experience with minions, NPCs, and a few bosses, if it just, just to lead you up to the big bad boss, what if the whole game was you and the big bad boss? What if, what if you and the boss fought through much different areas and had different interactions based on the areas you, you were in? So that's the feeling we're going for here. We want to showcase the first time the hero might meet the boss. Because in a normal game, when you're fighting against regular enemies, you know, yeah, you kill a lot of them, but that's, that's meaningless, you know, at least in comparison to the boss. So we want to have a, a thrilling experience with an opponent that's worthy of your time. So since our last update, we changed the purpose of our project. Uh, we're, we're now a portfolio piece. Uh, we did that for a few reasons. One, because of uh, time constraints. We were a little bit behind the other teams, so we felt like you know, having a portfolio piece with higher production value and limited scope would help, would help us out in that aspect. We also are a very technical team, and we feel like the boss fight is the best vehicle for us to show off those skills. And so it's going to be a boss fight in one area using three bullet hell elements. Now, those are very particular constraints, but we feel like those are going to lead to some interesting innovations. And that's also part of our, our purpose as a, a portfolio piece, to do things that other people aren't doing. So why 3D bullet hell? First thing, most important thing, bullet hells are pretty freaking cool. Okay. Second, the, the, second, the second thing is that 3D bullet hells are not done very often. You know, so we, we are excited about that challenge. And already the, uh, the challenge of doing a 3D bullet hell has led us to certain innovations. Uh, I'll, I'll go into this more in the demo, but the, the first thing that we realized we had to do was uh, remake the flight controller. And so now, so if you can see in that, in that GIF, the, or GIF, the hero is moving on a plane. And so uh, you know, that, that's, that's, that's one of the innovations that we were led to by these constraints that excited us. So very early on, we realized that the funnest thing about our game was the flight. So we wanted to have a good baseline for that. So we started looking at other games, and we settled on Rogue Squadron as our flight target. Because for a few reasons, one is that Rogue Squadron is you know, a classic. Second reason is, is Rogue Squadron is a third-person game where you, sh you fly and you shoot. And, so, uh, and then uh, also, too, there's a slow and a fast fly. So you see the X-Wing on screen. It's doing that. That's a mechanic that we replicated uh, within our game that we're going to show you in the in the demo. So now I want to talk a little bit about our, our character. Our character has been redesigned because we changed our theme from an avian theme to a Eastern Asian theme because we wanted something a bit more familiar. 
and it fits with some of the other whimsy that you'll see soon. And so, I keep, the mic keeps falling off, sorry guys, in, up out there in Streamland. So this process shows our character from, from concept uh, to block out and then to in-engine with, with, uh, with a basic texture on her. And uh, we were able to uh, reuse the, the basic silhouette, even though we changed the design, so that was good. And so here's the final glory shot of, of the hero in, in engine. Uh, she doesn't have her mask on because when we were, we, were, we were doing it, we were playing, we showed it to some people, it just wasn't reading as a mask. So we decided to take that out, but I want to show you our process of iteration, though. So now this is, our, this is a new addition to our project. This is our, this is our dragon. This is a quick 2D concept that is based on Al Kuang from uh, the famous story, Journey to the West. And he's going to be the, other, and the only other character in this game. So there's only going to be two characters, character, our hero, and then the boss. So here's our 3D, our 3D concepting phase, our first pass and the second pass. The first pass, we looked at the, the, the head, obviously, and then we moved on to the body. And then here's our progress right now. We have our, our decimated model that's painted, and that's what you'll see in our demo. So moving forward, we have our, I want to talk a little bit about our animation. So that's the animation uh, that, that you're going to see in the demo coming up here. And it's 100% it's procedural. And then we have, uh, on, on the right side here, we have uh, an animation retarget. We, we utilize the animations from the Flying Monk asset pack and then retarget it onto our character. Because we're a profile portfolio piece, by the end of our at the end of our project, we want to have one, completely 100% original animations. We've already started making progress towards that. So now I'm going to uh, talk about some of the things we've accomplished. I know it's a lot of text, but you know, bear with me. It's going to be a little boring. So for program, you know, ironic. Let's just go into the, the cutscene. Let's do the cutscene. <laughs> yeah. Hell. All right. <laughs> oh, it's not playing. It's not playing. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> I just looked at Tom and he was like, mm. OK, so now we're going to go into the demo. All right, so let's start her up. It's not up there. Yeah, yeah, I know. OK, so this, is, so this is our game. This is Project Dragon, guys. So uh, as you can see, it's in, in an environment of uh, floating islands. So the first thing we're going to demo is the flight controller. So Ronick, why don't you go ahead and show off the movement on a plane? So he's able to move in eight directions there. And so and to move forward, he does left trigger. And then to move backwards, he does left bumper. So this is a very unorthodox control style. But it makes a lot of sense in context of a bullet hell. Because if you think about the bullet hell, you're always trying to go towards the, the bullet emitters. So this, is, this really helps you keep control of your, of your character. And uh, it, it seems a little weird, but it feels good. So now go over to our art target. So. As you can see, we're going for an Eastern Asian or an Eastern Asian theme uh, with a hand-painted, stylized look. And uh, so, what you're seeing in here is these are 100% uh, con completely original art assets that we did. And then we also, the only ones that are not original are the rocks themselves and the trees. But we're going to take care of that in March. So now, okay. So now let's 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 fly. Let's 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 show them the level a little bit here. So go in the flight mode. So this is our flight mode. This is not a, a, a debug. This is not a debug feature. You know, this is uh, this is this is a way of giving the player some movement. And if, as we're flying around our white box level, we wanted to uh, make sure we showcase verticality, because uh, as we as we move on, we're going to be expanding the behavior of the boss, and we want to set up some set piece interactions with with the environment. We'll showcase uh, one of those a little bit later. And so, uh, and there you can also see the transition from the fast fly to the slow fly. You can see that the Rogue Squadron, uh, the Rogue Squadron uh, influence is there. So, all right, so now let's go up to that boss. So as you can see, sticking with our theme, the boss is serpentine in nature. He floats along there. 
you know, just, just like, just like that, you know. And then the things orbiting him are, are the bullet emitters. In the final game, they're going to be themed as phoenixes. The reason for that is because in, uh, in Chinese mythology, the dragon and the phoenix represent balance, the yin and the yang. So uh, it makes sense to see them together. So all right, so let's let's get into uh, let's get into some stuff. So why don't you why don't you turn on the um, turn on the, 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 the bullets now? Okay, so they're coming at you. So these are these are some of the varying patterns. So in, in our earliest in our earliest designs of these two weeks ago, <laughs> we um, had we had a lot of 2D 2D bullet patterns. But then we realized we really weren't doing the 3D aspect of, of the 3D bullet held justice. So moving forward, we're going to have a lot more 3D contract types justice types. Uh, Uh, reckless. So okay. So now, just we also have a basic attack. Oh, I give give a little shot. Let's shoot a little more. There you go. Okay. So it's like that. Okay. So you know what? Uh, now we're going to show you something that we've been experimenting with, and this represents our first pass. So uh, you know, Ryan, he looks a little hungry. Why don't you uh, why don't you go go feed him something? He's flying over there. Oh yeah, that dragon looks like he loves rocks. Let's get him. Okay, grab it. All right. So this is the this is our this is our tether mechanic. This this represents our our first pass at this. Uh, we're using this. We want to use see this mechanic evolve into a form where it allows for more dynamic interactions with the environment and with the boss. Oh, did you miss? I missed. Uh, he missed. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, he can't get a dragon. Won't eat today. You know. So so that's so that's our that's our progress so far on the gameplay demo. Now we're gonna go into back into the presentation. So the first, so uh, the first thing I want to do is I want to give credit to uh, the the song that you heard in the in the in the demo. The credits on the screen. Right now, we're currently in talks with a professional sound designer to compose us a song for the for the boss fight that uh, you just heard. That's in the same vein of that. So we're hoping to get that hooked up soon. And now I want to talk to you a little bit about our environmental process and so how we how we created the art target. First we started with the Zhang uh, the Zhang Jiang, uh, mountain asset pack to do the block out. This block out was assembled uh, by our level designers and our artists. And then we moved on to start the retexture process and then introducing more of our in introducing our own assets and then that brought you to uh, the final the final art target that you saw today. So now I want to go and break out our milestone schedule. Our milestone schedule is going to be broken into broad categories, uh, broad categories like this that that fit the theme of the the boss, the theme of the game appropriately. So March is going to be all about all about the dragon, all about the boss. So we're going to expand the AI, and then uh, introducing some more dynamic movement, get them off the spline, and then we're going to uh, have. Uh, an armor, an armor system that's going to lead to some more difficult interactions between the player and the boss, and then we're going to uh, be working on the turret behavior, which is going to, which means we're going to have more, um, more bullet patterns in, in the 3D contracts style, and then for art, we're going to do our turret model, which is going a turret model block out, which is going to be themed as a phoenix, as I said before, and then we're going to, we're going to optimize the animation for the. We're going to optimize the animation for the dragon uh, because right now he's 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 floating pretty well, but we want to we want to make that smooth. We want to feel good, and we're going to replace those trees and those rock assets. And then, uh, as far as production is concerned, we're going to do a, a second pass of the level uh, with the consideration of the of the new the, the improved dragon AI 
in there. And then we're going to begin a plan for focus groups. Uh, and then so we can start executing those uh, right in April. And then we're going to finalize the sound effects, uh, finalize the sound effects of that. So uh, that's March. And then so in April, we're planning on working on the character. In May, we're going to be working on the level. And then June, we're going to be miscellaneous stuff. In July, we're going to be, we're going to be have finalized things. So that's our milestone schedule. And OK, before I go, I want to say something. <laughs> so yes. when we began, the gone's the wrong way. When we began, when we began this, like this, this, this run up to vertical slice, it was very difficult on our on, on our team. You know, it's no secret we, we we were behind the first teams, the other teams after the first milestone. But I want to say I'm really proud of our team and how we came together and we 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 were relentless. Like just like the tone of our game, the the tone of our team is relentless. You know, and you know, everybody loves an underdog story, but it's hard being the underdog sometimes. So this is this is what we brought you here today. So, you know, I know it's a common producer thing to say, like, you know, with this team anything's possible. But I hope Big Pizza has, you know, made you kind of a believer today that, you know, even even after starting over, uh, you know, from nothing and starting from scratch, we were able to uh, put on this vertical slice for you. So what I'm going to do with this gong is, in a minute, I'm going to bang it. Okay. So, yeah, that's right. I'm going to bang the gong. OK, and so uh, after, so um, everyone in Baked Pizza is going to let out a satisfying ha. So I invite everyone in the audience, faculty included, you know, to, to give us a, a, a good ha. Because you know, uh, I want you to, to let out some of your uh, vertical slice frustrations and your, ga <laughs> <laughs> and your game developer blues. OK, so on the count of three ha. So ready? One, two, three. Ah! That's our presentation. Yes. <laughs> I was thinking that you should transition to the team if he wasn't already on it. <laughs> um, I know what bullet hell is because of um, programming one when SK is the <laughs> um, But I don't know that, I certainly didn't know what it was before that. I had no clue what it was. Um, and I feel like this presentation treated it like everybody just knows what that is. And it's a certain type of a game. And uh, that, that was just, it was not explained at all. Mm. Um, went to, to great lengths to explain uh, the boss interactions and why you're doing just a boss and all that. But, but I think because of the redesign, um, I really believe you owed it to the audience to kind of explain what type of game it is. I don't come away from it understanding really the scope of the different patterns and the different number of levels and things like that. And I wish I did, uh, because that would give me a better a better means of like answering some of the questions regarding scope and like, mm -hmm. do I think you can make this game and stuff? If I don't really have a sense of the scope, it's hard to answer that. Um, you 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 mentioned that the the controls of the game are unorthodox. Are they unorthodox for 3D bullet hell games, or are they unorthodox? Period. They're unorthodox for for flight games uh, because that was our 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 nearest analog because. You're, you're constantly moving forward because it's like a it's like a you know uh, it's like a dog fighting game or something like that, and so you have the on the stick you're just you're just you know moving up and down, but um, but yeah so that's that's why it's it's an unorthodox because and uh, most of the time there's no there's no uh, movement on the left trigger or or you know that's not how you move like forward and back, so but it, it makes sense in in context of when you're floating in a 3D space and trying to to avoid bullets coming at you. I hope that answered the question. Um, I think if, you, if you're, if you're self-aware that your control scheme is unorthodox, the way to try to mitigate that risk is to do early play testing. Yeah, that's why. That's exactly why we want to have our first focus group in in April. Okay, and 
by focus group, you mean letting your fellow clients play it? Oh, uh, yeah, letting the, well, the, the uh, clients have already been playing it, but uh, I wanted to get some outside people, some outside game developers to come in and, and do it. And I've been uh, working with one of my undergraduate organizations uh, to do that, yes. Okay. So, yeah, that's, that's a way to mitigate that risk. Um, I, I liked, um, so it was, a little, it was a little awkward when you brought in the part about the asset pack. Mm -hmm. We were looking at a scene that looked really nice. Um, I thought that, that that scene on the hill and stuff. And then you said, we created everything in this scene except for the rocks and the trees. And I was looking at a lot of rocks and trees. <laughs> and that, that felt like a weird way to say what you were trying to say. Because I have a feeling you were trying to get across that you, that you created a lot of art. Oh, and I forgot to say, too, that we also all the textures are ours as well. We retextured everything <coughs> as well. Yeah. Um, but but what I, I guess what I'm trying to get at is if your if your point was to sell that you had created a lot of art, kind of mission not accomplished with the way that you did it, the way that you worded it, because you were looking at a screen that was these big rock faces and beautiful trees and then a house, and you said we created everything here except the rocks and the trees, and it felt like you just created a house. And that yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. You probably created more than that is what I mean, right? Um, so probably not the best way to do it. If you look at the way the previous game did it, where they listed and they said, here is every asset in the game that was untouched, and it was just a handful. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, that feels like they created a lot of art, you know, because it was just these specific pieces. So maybe that would have been better, is to kind of show them little, you know, and then the fact that they were instants all over the place kind of lose that. I think it would have been the same thing as if the previous game would have said, looking at it and said, the only thing we didn't create here are the trees, and all you're looking at is trees. And it's mm -hmm. like, wow, you didn't create much. But the way they did it, it makes it feel like they created a lot. So like a question of quantification, like yes, like visual quantification. The way of communicating it yeah. seemed better. Um, so um, I still don't have a good sense of how much you created. The dragon, I guess, is all new, right? Yeah. And I thought the dragon looked super cool. Yeah. Uh, the way it was animating, the way it, just everything about it I thought was really, really neat and impressive. Uh, in fact, on that note, I thought that that opening part where the dragon flew through was really super like impressive. like. Was I not expecting that? Wow. I really wish that would have been the opening video, right? Where it's like the dragon comes through, and it's like, da da and then it's like, nope, before we get to battling that guy, we're going to talk about a presentation. It's like, oh, man, now I can't wait to see that. Mm -hmm. I'm excited. Instead, I saw what feels at this point like something unrelated. Mm -hmm. You know, a cool-looking AAA game that's done that I've never played before, and, and I don't see how that relates to what I saw. Oh, so to set, set the tone. Yeah, but... The tone seemed different. Um, okay, um, so that just in hindsight, uh, the 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 flyover dragon, that was like ten out of ten. Uh, that was super duper cool. Um, so more of that. That was that was really neat. A um, couple of niggly things, but they really bugged me. Um, I don't like five presentations where the presenter is talking over the audio, and there were times when the audio was too loud and you were trying to talk over it. And I would really recommend just turning off the audio when you're trying to communicate. Like, we heard the music and it was beautiful, mm -hmm. but I don't want to hear it if you're trying to communicate something to me. So I recommend talking, turning the video, and then letting the game play out. Uh, I think that would be a better, a better style. And then finally, one of your bullets on the, um, pun not intended, but on the, on the commitment thing was in this month, you're going to expand the AI. Mm -hmm. And I just want to caution you. That slide was full of that kind of stuff, and I'll just tell you why I don't like that. Is because let's say your programmers make the dragon slow down a little bit when you throw a rock at it. Did that expand the AI? Yes. So done. Uh, it's like I don't really have a way of being able to say whether you accomplished that next month or not, because you can say that you expanded it just a teeny tiny bit, and that beats the letter of what you committed to. Instead, be real specific about what we're going to see next month. You're going to, you say we're going to see an expanded AI? What? What is it going to do? Where is it going to go? How is it going to work? Um, a lot of that slide felt very vague it, all throughout. And I think nailing down, especially the next month, it would be important to be able to kind of really get a sense of your progress because you, that's, that's a mechanism by which you can hold your team accountable for the progress that you're making. 
And when you have very vague bullets like that, it makes it really hard to judge yourselves in your progress. When it's like, yep, we expanded the AI enough. But really, did you? You know? Mm -hmm. so, yeah, it makes uh, sense, yeah. You trust your team, but you really want to be specific about it. And if you have these, a lot of times I'll give this criticism to a, to a game team, and they'll say, oh, we have that. We could have showed that, but we don't. Well, why didn't you show it? Yeah. If you're really developing those detailed bullets, show us that you're developing that because it would add some context to the work that you're going to be doing in the next month. And then I can tell you if I think that that's too much work, if I think you're expanding in the right areas, et cetera. So that's all I got. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I can thank you guys made uh, tons of great progress. Again, you know, you, uh, like you said, you're a uh, uh, month behind the other teams because you kind of did a total reset. Um, so on the one hand, you know, in the real world, we don't give you credit, you know, there's no, uh, but uh, on the other hand, I think you've made up so much ground that uh, you're, you're pretty close to where your teams are anyway. So you guys should definitely give yourselves a pat on the back there. I can see the enthusiasm in the team on the screen. Uh, what we see, uh, uh, you know, up there being played, uh, everything is really looking good. You guys, if you could manage to keep up that kind of pace, which seems like it might be near impossible. Uh, uh, Maybe. You guys are just killing yourself. Well, we might get sued, but we could do it. Yeah, uh, sleep <laughs> is for the week. Um, you guys have done a tremendous job. I think um, some of the things, I, I don't really have any complaints about what I saw. Uh, I, I like everything I saw. Um, I, uh, some of the things that I think you're probably going to have to focus uh, maybe a little bit more attention on, um, I know 3D bullet hells are kind of confusing visually anyway, and that's going to be a big challenge. And I know uh, Ramek seemed to know what he was doing. I, it was just a confusion of dots to me on the screen. Mm -hmm. uh, I could see the occasional starburst, and again, I'm sure it's a matter of if you have tons of experience with it, uh, you get better with it. Uh, but um, uh, that's just going to be something that I think you're going to have to put a lot of love and attention into in terms of the speed of the bullets and, and the patterns of the bullets and the predictability and maybe how you can orient yourself in three-dimensional space to, to make it easier to dodge and stuff. That's, I think, a matter of iteration and evolution. You know, uh, you'll just get that the more you play it, the more tricks you'll come up with. So I, I don't think that's a concern. It's just something you guys should probably put some uh, extra attention into. I think um, kind of the same thing applies with you are in space, so uh, you know hovering. So uh, the, 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 the transitions uh, between the different positions are still uh, pretty pretty mechanical, and you'll want to try to make a lot of that feel a lot more organic and a lot more floaty. But that's again just iteration. For me, I think a lot of what you've got is is a great start, and probably the thing that I want to see most uh, uh, coming out of the end of March is. Iteration and smoothing those things out. I think that would actually be, to me, more important than trying to add a whole lot of new stuff. Of course, you always want to add new art and stuff like that. But mm -hmm. really, take what you've got and just spend the, spend the time to really smooth it out and, and put good production value in it. Um, you're probably going to have uh, some interesting challenges with uh, how you can really get a good UI, UX in there. Mm -hmm. um, I also, something that, again, I, I'm... I'm Giving you some slack because I know you're, you're uh, a little behind the eight ball, but something that I'm going to want to see uh, at the end of next uh, uh, the next work, uh, presentation is I, I want to get a better feel for what are the fail states and the end conditions. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, okay, you can get hit by bullets. I really don't know what being hit by a bullet precisely means yet. Uh, so uh, obviously you'll you have some sort of hit point system or some sort of uh, whatever it imposes penalties on the characters. So. You're probably going to put some attention in there. Like I said, rather than add new features, just sort of create depth out of the features that you have. I think that's probably the best use of, uh, uh, of, of the next upcoming month. Uh, I'm always in favor of taking your core and just polishing the heck out of it uh, before you go on to add new things. Uh, I, I love the idea of a, a game that is, in its entirety, one big running boss battle. I just think that's a really cool, inspired thing. It's kind of like the next step after you know that war. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> instead of multiple bosses, it's just one giant boss for the entire fight. I think that's really cool. I think you guys have made a lot of good decisions. I thought it was really smart to downscope uh, and focus on what you've got, and, and I think you should double down on that. Right? Just just keep it really narrow, really tight, and polish the heck out of it. If you're a portfolio piece right now, it's more important to do what you do well than it is to add, to add a quantity of stuff. So keep making the kinds of decisions you're making, and uh, I'll be really looking forward to what we see next month. Thank you. All right. One more time. All right. Ha! Time to get drunk. <laughs>